Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back here again. I want to thank my new wardrobe and makeup team. That would be Lori and Jay. Thank you very much for making me feel right at home and getting me ready. I bring you greetings from nearly 100 other churches in eight different states because I'm the regional director. And up until I resigned from my church in New Jersey last year, I only had to keep track of about 300 people. Now I get to keep track of over 1,000 people. Can't do it. <laughs> but I, I love what I do, and I love being able to come back out here. Uh, this is the third time I've been in your pulpit. I've enjoyed it every time and appreciated um, all of you. I appreciate how you treated me while I've been here. I get to say good things about you when I go to other people's churches, and it's delightful. I also bring you greetings from the east side of our state, where I come from in Bucks County. I hereby commission all of you to root ardently for the Philadelphia Eagles this coming Sunday. <laughs> yes, yeah, so over on that side of the state, we are ardent Eagles fans as you are Steelers fans. And I'm here to tell you that if the Eagles were not in it and the Steelers would have been, I would vote ardently for the Steelers because I'm a Pennsylvania boy just like you are. I titled my uh, sermon today, Famous Last Words, and you see that on the screen behind me. Jay, you're going to help me advance these, these screens when it's time, right? I was a little kamikaze growing up when I was a little boy. I was a full-throttled ADD, try anything, do anything. Whatever the risks were, I would weigh the, the risk versus how much fun it might be, and I would try it. And so as a consequence, by the time I was uh, 22 years old, I had 22 broken bones. And it wasn't because I was brittle, and it wasn't because uh, my bones were weak, it was because I was a little kamikaze, rambunctious little boy. And I was the oldest of a bunch of boys. I was very fortunate that I had a mom who was a tomboy herself, but she was a head nurse in a hospital. <laughs> Came in very handy, and I bear the marks on my body of a really good mom who somehow appropriated one of those large boxes that you see. I'm, I'm waiting for my notes to slide right off this pulpit. Maybe they will, and maybe I'll steal that music stand before this is over. My mother appropriated one of these large metal boxes that says first aid on it. Remember them? They were metal. They hung on the wall. You unlatched them, and the lid folded down with two chains that held it in place, and it was all manner of things to fix up people like me who would be cut or broken or bruised. And many was the time that I would be sitting on the edge of the bathtub with my mother kneeling on the floor with the lid open against my shins, and she's stitching me up from the latest thing that went wrong. I was three years old when I broke my first bone. My father was two stories up on a roof. He was repairing a chimney. My father was a, a builder and a mason by trade. There was a wheelbarrow down on the ground, and it had mortar in it. And he would fill buckets of drywall buckets and haul them up on the roof with him. And I'm the three-year-old happily watching Dad at work on the roof. I'm sitting on one of the handles of the wheelbarrow. Everybody with me so far? The wheelbarrow is full of mortar. And being who I was, I start bouncing on the handle. And I realize that I can make myself a cool little teeter-totter. It's going up and down, and I'm having a grand old time while he's up there on the roof. I bounced too hard. The whole wheelbarrow came back. All the mortar fell into my lap, and my leg got pinned under the leg of the wheelbarrow and broke. My dad, this is my strongest memory, my father sliding down the roof and jumping off and landing in the soft grass not too far from me. That was the first of my broken bones. When my mother and father brought me home from the hospital and I had this cool cast on my leg, I felt bad for them. I, I, I caused them a whole lot of heartburn because I'm the oldest and this is the first time this has ever happened to them. So I said to my mother, Mom, I, I, I'm sorry. I promise I'll never do that again. And my mother said famous last words because she knew her son. Well, I didn't know what that meant. So I said, Mom, what, what does that mean? And she said, you'll figure it out in time. Don't you hate that when you're young and the grown-ups use expressions and they won't tell you what it really means? And then you get older and you realize 
what it means. All right, so now, now we, spend, uh, we go ahead two more years and I'm five years old. I'm standing on a story and a half stone wall because when our house was built, it was built up on a slight hill, a lot like you have here. And they cut the embankment open to put the garage under the house so that the garage would be level with the street. You with me? Okay. There's two stone walls on either side of that. And I'm standing on one side of the stone wall and a neighborhood girl named Sharon Richardson is standing on the other and we are pretending to be opera stars. And we are singing I Don't Remember What. And I'm standing on the edge of this wall and I'm looking from about here to the third pew at Sharon. And we're singing back and forth. And at one point I had my arms out, I was really getting into this, whatever it was. And I noticed I was starting to do this. And unlike what I can do now and land on my feet, there was no steps under me. And off the wall I go, I hit the driveway on the front of my skull with my right hand out and it folded my arm back and broke my arm and fractured my skull. That was the first of two skull fractures. We go to the hospital, they fix me up, I come home. And I said to my mom, mom I'm really sorry. I'll, no, I'll never do that again. And she said famous last words. And then I said, you know what else I'm never gonna do? I'm never gonna play with any girl in the neighborhood again because when I fell off that wall, she ran home. And she didn't tell anybody. She didn't tell you, she didn't tell her mother. I laid in that driveway for half an hour and I said, Mom, I am never playing with, girls are useless. I'm not ever going, to, I don't want anything to do with them. And my mother again said famous last words. Now I'm 13 years old and I'm going into junior high school. And I figured out that girls in that day liked boys with their hair combed. And I was not one that cared a whole lot about that, nor whether or not my shirt was tucked in, but I noticed the coolest girls liked the boys that were put together and with their hair combed. So I started to carry a little comb in my back pocket. My mother, of course, noticed this and she said, I thought you wanted nothing to do with girls. And I said, well, mom, they're, they're okay. I'll just never marry one. And my mother said, oh, thank you. I've done this in other churches and they stare at me. And they say nothing. She said famous last words. And by then at 13, I knew what she meant. And thank you for being smart. I, I really, I had every confidence in you that you would get it. Today, we're gonna to look at a passage that are famous last words. It comes from John chapter 17. Jay, if you'd put that next screen up for me. <clears throat> Lori, I don't know who this is gonna bother here, but I'm, I'm gonna borrow this, all right? Because my, uh, my notes are sliding off your, your podium. I'll, I'll leave your mic right here. All right, what song would you like to sing? <laughs> this is a really famous chapter, and many of you already know it. And the problem with preaching on famous chapters is you really know it, and you've all heard a lot of sermons on it. This is a very unique chapter in the Bible. We're gonna read the whole thing. It's the one and only time where we have an entire prayer, start to finish, from Jesus written for us. A young John, one of Jesus' disciples, maybe the youngest one, is nearby, and I believe he's recording it. Or at least he was nearby enough that he could hear it, and because of the Holy Spirit, he was able to recreate it and write it down, and after nearly 2,000 years, we have it. We have this intact prayer. And those of you that know the prayer know that this is the night before Jesus is going to die. It was this reason he came into the world. He knows that he's going to die the following day, and he knows it's gonna be bad. Before the worlds were ever created, he, the Father, and the Holy Spirit got together on a plan where they said, let's create a, a universe, and we'll create a particular solar system that has a sun, 
and the third large piece of rock out from that sun will we'll create that as earth and we'll put people on that earth that are created in our image. And everybody said, yeah, this is a great idea. And I imagine somebody looked at the sun and said, you know, if we do this, you know what's going to have to happen. Human beings were, are going to screw this up and you're going to have to go down there and fix it. And it won't be pleasant. Well, we finally, after thousands of years of human existence, we finally arrived at the right time where Jesus, the night before, he's going to die and pay the penalty for what you and I should have to pay. See, you, you and I should have to be separated from God forever. All human beings should be because we can't live up to God's standard of perfection. And before you think that that's really unfair of an almighty God to expect that from his creation, when you're the king, you get to make the rules. And I'm sorry if that bothers you, but that's what the scripture says. What is unique about our God and his son Jesus and his Holy Spirit is that they weren't willing for us to stay in this condition of being sooner or later eternally separated from God. So Jesus comes all the way from heaven on a mission that they had agreed to long before, before the worlds were ever made, and it's the night before. And not only is it going to be a real bad night for him, it's going to be a real bad day. And he knows it's coming. In fact, it's going to be hideous. And the physical pain that he would suffer that night, that night that he's praying this prayer later on, and then all the next day, is nothing compared to what's going to happen to him when at the moment of his death, the Godhead the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are temporarily torn apart. It's the one and only time it ever happened, and it had to go that way. See, if there was no God the Son, and God the Father, and God the Spirit, when the Son died on the cross, God would be dead. Right? Yes? Nod, nod your head so that we don't have to be here until 3 o'clock. So this is where we are. It's the night before, and Jesus is praying this anguished prayer. We know from other Gospels that part of the prayer that's not recorded in this chapter, little snippets of it, are Jesus crying out to his Father, and I don't mean to be disrespectful here, Dad, is there any other way we can do this? This was the human part of Jesus speaking because he knows how bad this is going to be. Dad, is there another way? Is there... But the God part of Jesus realized, nope, I am obedient to my Father. And thus we have this prayer, and this is where we are. So turn to John 17. I'm going to read it off of large print paper because I'm getting old now and my eyes aren't what they used to be. You can read it from your Bible, from your, your device, your phone, whatever you have on you. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. I'm not reading from that because I think it's necessarily better than everything else. I've just noticed as I'm getting older that when you have a really famous passage of Scripture, sometimes it's fun to hear it in an accurate but newer translation with different wording. You, you'll tend to hear things a little bit different, and I'm hoping you will too. In fact, let me stop for a minute and pray that that will happen. Father, I, I do thank you for preserving this, this um, stunning prayer this anguished prayer from a son to a father. And I thank you for what we learn about the Godhead, about your son Jesus, and about you as a father. I'm thankful for what we learn in this. And as we open your word today and go through this, I pray that you will show us something a little bit different um, and impress us with that. Now, that can only happen by the third party, the Holy Spirit, who lives within those of us who have trusted Christ as Savior. And I pray that his power would be activated in us and we would see things that you would want for us today. I'm thinking about that and I'm praying that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, John chapter 17. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one who, who you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. 
I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so that they bring me glory. Now, I am departing from this world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name, so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so that they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong in this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world, and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for those disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be all one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. See, that's the moment at which you know that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit got together on this plan before the universe was ever created. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do, and these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. Some prayer, huh? Some prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but there's some questions that I think about when I read this. So I'm going to ask you some questions. And some of them, feel free to call out answers when when you know. So here's question one. Jay, if you put that next screen up for me. I'm not going to turn around and just depend that you you all have this right, okay? Good. And if, if that fails, I have the whole thing up here, and I'll just hold this up here for you to see it. Here's my first question. What or who was Jesus thinking about in this prayer? It's not a rhetorical question, and it's not a library. What or who is Jesus thinking about in this prayer? Be more specific. I'm sorry? There we go. He's thinking about his followers. And not not only the followers there, but we just read where he says, I don't pray for them, but for all those who will come after them. Did you hear that? Did you hear me read it? And you read it? He's thinking about all of his followers then, and he's thinking about all the followers that will come after him. And guess what? That's us. He thought about everyone who would ever become his follower when he's praying this prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but if you went to the doctor today and you found out, God forbid, that tomorrow was your last day of life, and let's say it would even be an easy death, 
if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, would you be thinking about everybody else in the world? Would you be thinking about your community? Would you be thinking about all the people that you met in your life? Would you be concerned about them? I wouldn't be. If I knew I was going to die tomorrow, I'd be calling on my children, I'd be getting my grandchildren, I'd be getting my bride, I'd be getting everybody that meant anything to me and said, come over, I have a few things I need to share with you, the, the people who are the most in close to me. I wouldn't be thinking about all of you, I'm sorry to say. You're all fine people, but if I knew I was going to die tomorrow, I don't think I'd be thinking about any of you, except maybe Jay, who's advancing the slides on time for me. So that's the, the, the first thing we have to think about. And so how is Jesus thinking about those disciples then and then us? Jay, next screen. Jesus is thinking about us in three ways. He's thinking about our security. He is praying, asking God to protect us from the evil one. He's praying about our sanctity, that is the, the set apartness of what we are. He declares that the world's going to hate you because it hated me, because you are not of the world as I was not of the world. So he's praying for not only that we would be secure, and kept from the evil one and his powers, but that we would be set apart for something unique, for something different, for something completely not of this world. And the third thing he prays for at great length, and it gets a little tangled up, doesn't it, when you heard me read it about I and you and you and me and this and that, no, 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 no. It, it starts to get a little bit fuzzy until you slow down and read it slowly, and you realize that what he's really, really praying about, because he spends more time on this part of it, is our unity. Jesus knew our human nature because he had one too, only without sin. And because he was almighty God and a man at the same time, he knows what we really are like. And he knows that at any given time, any collection of believers from time to time will get sideways with themselves. And we usually get sideways over things that actually don't really matter in terms of breaking up. He knew that we would have trouble staying and being unified. He knew that would happen. Have you ever heard the, the definition of a def, the, the, the definition for a helicopter? Anybody ever heard that? No rotor heads here. Okay, I, I was fixed wing, but I, I knew enough about rotor heads. A helicopter is a collection of 10,000 moving parts that any one of which at any given time is threatening to fly apart. A helicopter is a pretty complicated piece of e equipment and it, a lot of times little things go wrong in a helicopter and they don't glide very well. So when things go wrong, you're probably going to drill a hole. The church is a little bit like that because it's composed of sinners. And just because we have trusted Christ as Savior doesn't mean sin is removed from us the penalty for sin has been dealt with because we have two problems. We have a sin problem and we have a death problem. And Jesus fixed both of them with his own death on the cross. He paid for the sin that you and I should have to pay for. We're gonna celebrate that in just a minute. And by the way, um, Gail or whoever puts together the, the worship guide, I, I love how you have in your worship guide for communion, the celebration of communion, it truly is. It truly is that, and we will be celebrating that in just a minute. But Jesus fixed those two problems, but he knew us and he knew our nature, and he knew that we are all too prone with getting sideways with each other and flying apart. It, it's why he spends so much time on this subject. So he's praying that we would be secure, He's praying that we would be set apart for something very special, and he's praying for our unity. So here's my next question. Jay, if you put that up. What would this look like? We just saw that he prayed for us and those three things. What would this look like if Jesus has his prayer answered? What would it look like? Well, I think it probably looks like this from, from that chapter. It will look like Next screen. It will look like we have unity among ourselves. It will look like we have love for one another. 
and it will look like we are about his mission. First of all, we would be unified. Now, we have trouble doing this, as I just said. So from time to time, we do get sideways with each other. By and large, though, the church from the beginning in the first century until now has figured out a way to still be the church, even if individual churches get into trouble. The church is still here, big C church. It's still all over the world. We are still the body of Christ. And that prayer of his was answered. We will have love for one another. Most of you know that famous passage a couple chapters before. Also within that t- same time period, the last couple of days of his life, where Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I give you a new commandment. I want you to love one another because by your loving one another shall all men know that you belong to me. So think of love as a uniform that we wear with, with rank and insignia on our sleeve that identifies us as being belonging to Christ. That love uniform we wear is what we wear to be identified to the rest of the world. Now, all too often as Christians, we don't show the world this. We get righteously indignant over this and that and the other thing in our culture. We get mad when certain people get elected to office that we don't like. We get mad when they pass laws that we know are not according to God's will for our world. It's okay to be upset about all that, and we should do what we could, living in a free society, being able to vote. We should do what we should to make our opinions known. But if that's all that the watching world knows of us, then where is the love that's the identifier that they're supposed to see when we're at odds with each other, or we're walking around mad all the time because our political candidate didn't get into office? If you are catching yourself being mad too much of the time all day long, you have a certain news channel on, you're listening to certain news feeds, certain things on the radio, and all they do is reinforce how angry you are that this world is going to hell in a wheelbarrow. The expression used to be in a handbasket, right? Well, there's enough going wrong where it's a wheelbarrow, right? If you're walking around mad all the time, because of how this is going, it's time to start dialing some of that back. Don't disengage from voting and making your opinions known to your public elected officials. Don't stop that. But make sure that love is the uniform that you're wearing, not this angry Christian who's mad because the rest of the world doesn't believe like we do. Jesus wanted us to love each other, and he wanted love to be our identifier. And lastly, if we, if we hear Jesus' prayer, we will be on his mission. I, I get to talk in a lot of churches, and, and I get to speak to a lot of Jesus' followers. And I'm surprised from time to time when churches believe that that they need to come up with what the mission is for this church to do. I'm glad having worked with this church now for the last year and something with your leadership, I'm glad to report that this church understands what the mission is. The mission is to go and make disciples. We get this from Matthew chapter 28 and we get it from Acts chapter 1. In Matthew 28, Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples. I want you to teach them everything I have taught you. I want you to baptize them. I want you to fulfill my mission. And by the way, I am the commander in chief and I have all authority and I will always be with you. That's the mission. We don't get a choice of what the mission is. Our job (laughs) is to hear those words come to attention and say, aye, aye. I, I was Navy, so those of you who were Air Force or Army or Marines, I'm sorry. Aye, aye, sir. That's the mission, and that's what Jesus wanted us to carry out because he was shortly to take his body, his new body, with him to heaven. And when Jesus took his new body to heaven with him, the body of Christ was not here anymore, was it? So guess what he did? And only, only a brilliant, wise trinity could have figured this out. There would need to be Jesus' body here on earth as a presence after he left. There would need to be one. 
So if Jesus had stayed here in his new body and lived forever, he would be located in one place. And like the Dalai Lama, anybody who was a Jesus follower would, would have to make a pilgrimage to wherever he was to find out what was his plan for my life. You get it? But when Jesus went to heaven and took his new body with him, he said, all of you, my followers, collectively will be my body. And now Jesus' body is all over the world at all times, in different places, different cultures, different time periods, different localities, different ways of worshiping. It's a brilliant plan. Jesus took his body with him. There would need to be a body here, and we're it. And this was his mission. He wanted us to have unity among ourselves. He wanted us to love one another as the identifier, and he wanted us to be on his mission. So now it's going to get a little more interesting. Jay, if you put the next one up. <clears throat> what is the likelihood that Jesus' prayer will be answered or fulfilled? He prayed this prayer, and you, a lot of you are old enough now to have been in one or more churches in your life, and you've seen things go right, and you've seen things go wrong. So I'm asking, what's the likelihood that Jesus' prayer will be answered and fulfilled? You think it's like 50% or... 75 percent what 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 do you think the, the likelihood is i'm sorry thank you next screen jay a hundred percent it's a lead pipe cinch that he's going to get what he asks for a hundred percent why why is that why next screen please because Jesus' will always aligns perfectly with his Father. See, when Jesus prays and asks for anything, he's so in sync with Dad, I don't mean to be disrespectful, they have an intimate relationship, he's so in sync with Dad that he knows exactly what Dad wants done in cooperation with his Holy Spirit working here on this planet and inside of us. He is so in sync with God's will that even though the human part of him says, is there any other way we can do this? The God part of him says, oh, I, I agree to this and I'm gonna be obedient to dad. Think of it this way. Think of this being God's will for life. Uh, this is a size 15 hand, I, I hope you can all see it. Think of this as Jesus' will for his life. When Jesus prays, it's not just that they touch and they agree. It's not even that they overlap a little. They are a perfect fit for each other. God's will and Jesus' will are the same thing. Now, you and I, we look more like that, maybe, on our good days. And on a really good day, maybe we look like this. Most of the time, I'm afraid we look like this or maybe getting close. Have you ever prayed prayers that you knew were biblical prayers, you knew were according to the heart of God, and it felt like your prayers were bouncing off the ceiling? You know when that happens? That happens when you're faced with some health threat, and it's gonna be serious. And you'll pray, and others will pray around you for God to remove or fix or heal this thing that's going on with you. Or one of your kids goes astray, and maybe they get really sideways. Maybe they're in an addiction. Maybe it looks like you could lose your child for the rest of their life. Or what if it's a grandchild and you pray earnestly that God would deliver them from whatever this is. Or maybe you're in such a financial jam that you're pretty sure that IRS agents are gonna come down this front aisle and take you out of here like this because you're in such a jam. And you pray and you pray and you pray that God will be glorified and fix this problem. And it's a good prayer. It's the one you should pray but it doesn't come about. You ever been there? I have. I prayed for good things, and it felt like my prayers were reaching the ceiling and bouncing back and falling on my hapless little head. We had a daughter that got more than a little sideways when she was in her later 20s, and a lot of bad things happened. I'm happy to report today that God allowed her to recover her life, and now at 44 years old, she's a wonderful, I think, girl. She's a wonderful woman. But I've been there, and I'll bet you have too. 
The reason that we don't get everything we ask for is we're not praying according to God's will. See, God will always answer prayer, but it may not be the answer you want to hear. It's either going to be yes, or it's going to be no, or it's going to be wait. Now, I'm really thrilled when it's yes. I can even deal with when it's no most of the time. I have a real problem with wait. Um, I told you I was a rambunctious boy and I have ADD. And when I am sure that what I'm praying for is what God's ultimate plan ought to be for that person's life, I, I want it now. I don't want to hear wait. I don't want to hear years go by. I don't want to hear that and I'll bet you don't either. One of the biggest lessons we can take from this prayer of Jesus to his Father is that his will perfectly aligns with his Father's will. And the reason we don't get everything we ask for is because ours looks more like this, or this, or even this. It's right to ask God for those things that are on your heart. That's a good thing. Where we can and do go wrong is when we expect God to be some sort of a, a magic genie in the lamp that we rub, and out he comes with the three wishes, and, and they will be granted. God doesn't operate that way. God does things to and with and for us that we have no idea why at the moment, or maybe moments later. Have you ever known people in your life, and maybe you've done this, as a pastor, I, I've heard this often, Pastor, when I get to heaven, I, I'm going to sit down with God and I'm going to say, why, 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 and all, all of this. Have you ever known people that have done that, where they're so vexed by something or they've had such a terrible hurt in their life? I am going to ask God, why did you do that? And I always smile at them and say, my dear, no you won't. When you get to heaven, you're going to be so thankful that you're there and you're going to be so bedazzled by the beauty and the majesty of the God that you have never seen, and the Jesus, his son, sitting at his right hand, that everything you thought you were going to ask was going to go right out of your head. And aren't you glad that really it works that way? I am. I am. You should be too. So our will, aligning with the Father, exactly like Jesus did, let's be real here. It's not likely to happen for any of us for all of our life. There are moments where it will be, but we're going to strive towards that. We're going to work towards that. It's a worthy thing to work toward. And the best news of all, according to the scripture, it's a learned skill. You can actually learn to do this better and better as you get older. Or maybe some of you who are really young, you already figured it out. And if that's the truth, come see me. And the next time I'm scheduled to preach here, I'll have you do it. How's that? You're allowed to laugh. It's not a library. <laughs> Let's sum up where we are so far. Jesus was thinking of us in this prayer. He wants us to be unified with himself and with each other. He wants us to love each other as our identifier, and he wants us to fulfill the same mission as was his, and then we will be known as sent ones, which is what the word missionary means. So now where we are, where that leaves us is, all right, Pastor Ron, I'm, I'm willing to buy most of this or all of this. How? How is this going to happen? Well, first of all, it reminds me of my father-in-law, who was my pastor growing up. And uh, before he ever became my father-in-law, he was my pastor. He had a very stern uh, wife. My pastor's wife was a very stern and authoritarian German woman. I grew up with them. I knew exactly where she was coming from. She could be a lot of fun when things were going the way she wanted them to. But when they weren't, she was pretty stern and pretty authoritative. I didn't come from such a good family. I came from a family of horse thieves and hell raisers. I didn't come to faith until my early teens. My parents didn't come to faith until they were in their 40s. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to tell you that myself and all of my brothers and my sister and my parents all came to faith in Christ, but I didn't grow up like that. And my pastor's wife, Mrs. O'Brien, knew that. 
So I've known Kathy, her daughter, since I was 11 years old. And one day, when I was 14, I'm walking out of the auditorium, and I'm making my way through the lobby, and the pastor and his wife are there shaking hands. Good message, pastor. Good message, pastor. Good message, pastor. And I'm one of the last ones, and before I hit the line, and, th and they were there by themselves at that point, I turned around and looked back into the auditorium, and I saw Kathy whom I'd known for then three years, and I turned back to what were going to become my in-law parents, and I turned back to them and I said, I'm going to marry that girl. <laughs> I'm 14. I, I, was, uh, I was pretty bold and pretty, pretty cheeky. And Mrs. O'Brien looked at me like I was a bug because she knew that I was one hormonal pimple. And she didn't have this in mind for her daughter. And I had to chase eight more years before I finally ran her down. And, um, and when I married their daughter, I had the most wonderful mother-in-law. Whatever the mother-in-law jokes are that you hear, they were not true of Mrs. O'Brien. Um, it just took eight years of chasing and convincing, and I finally got there. The point of all of that is that you and I find ourselves in a place where what I'm calling us to do is going to become a multi-year project. It's going to be the rest of your life. It's going to be a learned skill. So how do we accomplish this in our life? By alignment to the Father's will. How do we do that? Do we just pray it and guess about it and, and do as best we can? No. Fortunately, the Lord God saw fit to have something we call the New Testament created within the first 150 years or so after Jesus was here. It was codified. We all have it printed. It's in lovely binding, or you can get it on your device, or you can get it on your iPad. We have the Word of God. Now, if you've never learned this or heard this, you should write this down. The Bible is our sole and only authority for doctrine, faith, and practice. This church believes that. Words similar to that are in your bylaws. They should be. It comes from an ancient creed that our forebears developed. The Bible is our sole and only authority for doctrine, faith, and practice. There are other inputs to receive God's truth. We can walk outside and look at the beauty of the day. We can go out at night and look at the, at the heavens. We can be in the woods and appreciate what's there. There are different inputs for receiving godly understanding and wisdom. But the only authority is the Holy Scripture, our only authority for doctrine, faith, and practice. So what does this mean for us? That means that if you're not in it every day, reading it somehow, I don't care how you do it, whether you, you flip it open and point your finger and then look and see like throwing a dart and, and you read that passage that day. I don't care if it's that way or you have a read through the Bible plan in one year. I, I, I don't care. But we need to be in it every day because it has an intrinsic power all its own because it is the very words of God that he wants us to know in this life. Now there's way more truth in this world and to God than there is in the Scripture. It doesn't mean the Scripture is flawed, it just means everything in there that He wants us to know now is what's in there. When we get to heaven, we'll understand a whole lot more. But you've got to be in it every day because from that we learn what it's going to take to align our will to His will. We're going to read and learn how we are supposed to live. We are going to read and learn how we're supposed to think. We're going to read and learn what it is we ought to be praying for so that when we pray, we're liable to get what we ask for just like Jesus did because our will will align with the Father. This alignment of will is an every single day work that we have to do. We have to choose this every single day. We have to choose our will to be aligned with the Father. You're not going to know how to do it, really, and you won't have much success with it unless you know what's written in God's Word. So be in it. Be obedient to the Word of God when you read it. The more you're obedient to the Word of God, the more likely your will will align to the Father's. Everybody get that? 
Nod, please. Everybody nod. Thank you. Thank you. I want us to transition now to this celebration moment. If ever there was, so I'm going to ask for the, the guys to come down. John uh, and Steve and whoever, Mark, all, all you guys come down. Um, if ever there was a moment where our wills align perfectly with the Father, this is the table, this is now. Because it's in this moment we realize that we are the body of Christ. You probably knew this, but this, come on down guys, this celebration that we do is an object lesson, but it's taken from the Jewish Passover. The night before he died, Jesus had one more dinner with his disciples. It was the Jewish Passover. And in their economy, everything on that table represented something. So when, when you study in the Old Testament and through the Levitical priesthood over the course of centuries, you find out that every single thing that's on the table, even today with Jewish Orthodox Jewish people, every single thing had a meaning to it. Well, Jesus knew that too, and so did they. So they're at this table, and he picks up two things. He, he picks up bread that's on the table, which would have been unleavened bread, and that had its own symbol to it. And he picked up a cup of wine, and with these two elements, he used them as an object lesson expressed for all of us. In these moments that we do this, we are unified together as the body of Christ, the way Jesus prayed that we would be. So, if you're here today and you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, and you know that your sins are forgiven, not because you earned it, but because you asked him to forgive you, and he did, and if you asked in faith believing and reliant on Jesus' sacrifice for you alone to save you from your sin, then you also know from the scripture that there's a home waiting for you in heaven when you're done with this life. If you're here today and you don't, you're not a member of this church or maybe you're new here today, um, you are welcome to participate in all of this with all of these other good people who regularly go to church here. If any of you are fuzzy about this and you don't really understand what you're doing with this or what this really means, let it all go by and come talk to me or one of these guys after the service and we'll get you squared away on all this. We'll, we'll help you understand what this is really doing. On that last night, he picked up bread and he said, this will represent my body, which is being broken for you. Mark, would you pray for the bread, please? <clears throat> 